Welcome back, everybody, to this part two on the topic of ADHD and hoarding behavior and disorder. This is Mr. Wonderful, Russ Barkley. I say that because I realize after the fact just how often I use the word wonderful in part one to describe my fantastic trip to Italy for the past 12 days or so. Uh, apologies for that limited use of my vocabulary. Uh, let's continue with this discussion. In part one, I had asked subscribers to provide us with some comments on why they thought ADHD might be relating to, related to hoarding behavior and disorder. Uh, and I got some really good replies in uh, the comment section. So thank you all very much if you took time to share your insights into this and also to note whether or not this was a problem for you. Because as you know, uh, hoarding behavior and disorder is rarely, if ever, mentioned in discussions of ADHD as being a significant problem or comorbidity. Now, you may not know that Hoarding disorder is defined in the DSM-5 with a set of useful diagnostic criteria. And it is classified under the OCD category of disorders in DSM-5. As you also know from part one, research is raising significant doubts as to whether that's an appropriate classification for hoarding disorder, given what is now being revealed about the rather strong relationship of ADHD to this type of behavior and disorder. If you're not familiar with it, uh, here is a list of the criteria in DSM-5 for hoarding disorder. Uh, and basically it says that hoarding disorder is a persistent difficulty with discarding or parting with possessions, regardless of their actual value. The difficulty is due to a perceived need to save the items and to the distress associated with discarding them. The difficulty discarding possessions results in the accumulation of possessions that congest and clutter active living areas and substantially compromises their intended use. If living areas are uncluttered, it is only because of the interventions of third parties, such as family members, cleaners, or even authorities. The hoarding causes clinically significant distress or impairment. That's very important because as I've said before about ADHD, a behavior that is significantly common and severe only becomes a disorder when it eventually leads to either impairment in major life activities, such as social, occupational, marital, work, or other uh, important areas of life, uh, or where it results in significant personal distress. The hoarding is not attributable to another medical condition, such as a brain injury and so on. And it is not better explained by the symptoms of another disorder. By the way, those last two qualifications are part of all disorders in the DSM-5. It simply means we need to take time to engage in differential diagnosis. Um, the DSM-5 also goes on to say that one should specify whether the hoarding disorder is associated with excessive acquisition. This means that there's difficulty discarding possessions uh, that is accompanied by the excessive acquisition of things that are not needed uh, and for which there is no available space. By the way, it points out that 80 to 90 percent of people with hoarding disorder display that feature, this excessive acquisition of possessions. Uh, it also says to specify whether or not the disorder is associated with good or fair insight, poor insight into one's behavior, uh, or uh, absent insight entirely. The individual simply doesn't see it as problematic, even though loved ones and others certainly do. So that's our DSM criteria. We can see then that there's a dimension of hoarding behavior. And as this hoarding behavior becomes more and more common, and the clutter uh, and other problems that it creates becomes more and more likely, it becomes a disorder when it leads to impairment or distress. 
Okay, now let's go back and let's take a look at the various comments that were received with regard to part one of this commentary. Uh, and also I'm going to share some of my own uh, insights into what I think may be happening here as well. But I have to say that we really don't know yet why ADHD links up with this behavior and this disorder in terms of scientific research illuminating the possible mechanisms and mediators through which ADHD links up with hoarding and so on. So uh, just understand that this is speculative. Granted, it's informed speculation, but it is speculative nonetheless. So let's bring up the usual PowerPoints that I like to show. Uh, and let's talk about the linkage between these two. Uh, why would ADHD be associated with hoarding behavior and disorder? Well, first of all, let me note that it is associated to a significant degree. The last commentary on this topic, part one, pointed out that approximately 25 to 35 percent of people with ADHD are likely to have hoarding behavior and disorder, and vice versa. It turns out that among people with hoarding disorder, approximately 20 to 35% or more may have ADHD or significant symptoms of that. And the research also pointed out that two of the apparent predictors or mediators of this relationship were a degree of inattention and degree of deficient executive functioning. By the way, those overlap to the point of being perhaps almost synonymous. The inattention of ADHD really is indicative of a broader problem with executive functioning. But let's just leave it that it's not really the hyperactivity or the impulsivity that's related to this as much as it is the inattention and executive functioning or EF aspects of ADHD. So it turns out that there are a number of possible explanations for this. The most obvious one is the inattention distractibility symptoms of ADHD. Uh, if someone is very inattentive and distractible and they use something and they're inattentive, they're likely to just drop it at the point where it was last used and then forget about it, leading to a great deal of clutter and disorganization. They forget or simply fail to engage in the next step after we complete using objects, uh, and that is to put them back where they belong if we think we're going to need them again, uh, or to discard them if we evaluate them as not necessarily useful in the future. So uh, inattention could explain this kind of disorganized, sloppy, cluttered uh, environment. And that is because the individual is simply skipping from one thing to another to another. As soon as one thing is done, they move to another, they go to the next shiny thing, then on to the next distracted uh, event, and so on. So that could explain why we see so much debris uh, in the environment, disorganization. That's not really hoarding, though, is it? It's really just more of a sloppiness and very casual approach to uh, putting things back where they belong. The excessive acquisition that goes with hoarding might require additional explanation. Another factor, as the research showed, is executive functioning. And one of the major executive functions in daily life is self-organization. You'll remember from my videos here about executive functioning that there are seven or more, but at least seven mental or cognitive executive function components. But we see when we look at other people, their executive functioning in daily life, of which there seem to be about five dimensions. So the cognitive components lead to executive behavior, and we can classify executive behavior in five dimensions. Time management, emotion regulation, self-organization, problem solving, uh, inhibition, and so on. So uh, it's possible that the disorganization, or the, excuse me, self-organization component of EEF is the problem here. The individual simply can't bring themselves to organize the environment to the extent that other people do. Organizing our environment and keeping them organized requires effort, requires time, 
requires contemplation, thinking about it a little bit, uh, and certainly the extra effort needed to put things back where they belong, or if not necessary, we've used them to discard what is left of them rather than have it clutter up the environment. So there is a preference in people for self-organizing to be more efficient in our behavior and to be ready for future task performances. We don't want things in the way that aren't going to be necessary when we get ready to do something, uh, but we also want to make sure that we do retain the things that are likely, that's the key word, highly likely to be useful again, and then put them where they're necessary, what we call the point of performance. Where am I most likely to need this object? That is where it should be when I get ready uh, to put it back. So the point of performance. Another possible mechanism some people mentioned was indecision. Uh, the inability to simply make up your mind. So I've got this thing, I've used it, I probably should get rid of it, but I'm not sure if I should. I'm not adequately contemplating the value or utility of this object for later instances in my life. Just can't make up my mind. My mind is kind of a dumpster fire, jumbled mess. Uh, and as a result, I just drop the object where I last used it and don't organize it. Uh, and as a result, I wind up with a lot of stuff around me that I simply don't need. Again, this could explain the clutter in people's lives. Again, as with the others, I'm not sure how well it explains the excessive acquisition of things and the failure to part with them, this feeling that I'm going to need this again. Uh, and even though that's not likely, the individual overestimates the likelihood of its utility and wants to keep it around. So that's a possibility. Um, we also know that uh, from comments in the section of the replies for this last video, that some people with ADHD, in fact many of them, have a very high time preference, as I've said, when I talked about ADHD and time. Uh, that is, they see things as being of value only in the now, and they're not able to contemplate things in the later and how valuable or invaluable they may be. So consequently, again, harking back to the indecision, they're just not sure if they're going to need it again later. They're not very good at thinking about the laters in life and valuing those, uh, and therefore they can't discard it. They can't make up their mind about it, and so they just hoard it. They just keep it around in the off chance that it might be needed later on. That could be one possibility. I'm not convinced about that yet, but it's, it's out there. Uh, there's also the emotional dysregulation associated with these objects that one is accumulating. A lot of people pointed out that they keep these things around because they have positive memories associated with them. They found these things to be useful in the past, so I think they're going to be useful in the future. I don't want to part with that because it means a lot to me, so there's kind of a sentimental value that's linked to these objects. And because I can't regulate my emotion as well as others, which means I also can't be objective with myself and my needs as well as others, I keep these things around, even though in point of fact, objectively, they have little, if any, future utility and should be discarded. That's a good possibility. We talked about ADHD uh, individuals having significant problems with emotional self-regulation. It's one of the major uh, EFs in daily life that I've already mentioned. Um, so that's an entertaining hypothesis that we might want to think about. Another which research also showed is linked to hoarding behavior and disorder is depression. It was in fact the second most likely predictor of hoarding behavior after ADHD inattention. In one study it actually was the major predictor. Uh, but nonetheless, depression may be involved in hoarding. Why is that? Well, depression usually involves a loss of pleasure uh, and, uh, and a failure to care about future consequences, future needs, uh, and therefore the individual simply, again, after they've used it, just drops it, moves on. They're not even thinking 
about the future needs here. They're ruminating, they're obsessing, they're re-visualizing or reimagining problems in their life. They're in their head so much, they're just not attentive to the environment, its organization, the need for objects or not, all of which could lead to clutter uh, of uh, objects no longer needed, to being disorganized, and even leading to relatively filthy living conditions. Because organizing, cleaning, decluttering take effort, and depressed people are not likely to expend as much effort on such activities. The, as one subscriber pointed out, the more clutter, the more debris, the more hoarding could actually feed back to actually worsen depressive feelings because the individual now begins to see, oh, I've got this problem, I can't seem to get rid of these things, it's just one more reason why I should feel bad about myself, uh, and then it further worsens the depressive feelings. Let's not forget, however, that depression is also often linked with anxiety and that at least 25% of ADHD children and upwards of 40 to 50% of ADHD adults often have comorbid anxiety. So there could be an anxiousness about parting with an object that might possibly have future utility or might have sentimental value. The individual is afraid if they get rid of it and they need it later, that's going to be a problem. They may have to repurchase it again. So they just can't bring themselves to part with this particular sentimental or potentially useful object. They get anxious about it. And one way to allay that anxiety is to keep these things. Again, I don't know how well any of these explanations account for the excessive acquiring, the actually going out and getting more stuff and then not being able to get rid of it. Uh, so that remains, I think, to be explained. So all of that said, let me uh, just point out here, I really appreciate the comments of subscribers. If you have any more besides the things we've talked about here and you want to add them in there, I do try to take a look at many of the replies that come in, especially for the valuable ones. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll have a part three of this video on hoarding behavior and ADHD in the future. But I want to thank everybody for, who did take the time to reply and give us your insights. Uh, and also, once again, say that if you enjoy this information and you find it valuable, please recommend this channel to others. Uh, if you are not a subscriber, consider clicking the subscriber button. And if it interests you, uh, on the homepage of this channel are listed links to the four most recent books of mine dealing with ADHD in adults, uh, ADHD in children, 12 principles for raising a child with ADHD, uh, and so on. Also, if you haven't been over there, have a look at my website, russellbarclay.org. There's fact sheets over there that you can print out, uh, other information, obviously a whole list of my books uh, and rating scales. So see if there's anything over there that might be of interest or value to you. So thanks everybody for joining me for this commentary uh, and perhaps we'll revisit hoarding behavior again. Take care everybody and be well.